The hole itself is plated. Oh, so oh you mean on the on the, the inside ones the so, inside isn't? Correct. So on the copper ones, they just put a pad, top and bottom, right? This is the top and this is the bottom, and they punch a hole in it, go done. But they aren't connected electrically. Okay, wait, I have a question. But on the other ones, they're plated, they're drilled, and then they plate it. So um, top to bottom, it's connected. So I've had a few of those where I end up soldering the shit out of it yep. and um, you pour off the pad. I tore off the pad. Does that, that mean that my, I was using like a one that wasn't properly connected? Probably means you're using too much heat. You can delaminate the adhesive with too much heat. And if you if you heat it up and pull on it, it'll peel off. Oh, oh! Even I was only I was only peeling off the plate, not the actual. Uh... It's really hard to pull the, the plating out of the barrel, but if you're using this stuff and you peel off a pad, it's like shit. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. You forgot the worst type though, with no copper at all. I, that, I started on those. Yeah, and there's nothing. And then oh, the parts, it just rattles around in there. <laughs> how, how the fudge does that even work? Can you just connect metal? everything. There's no pads Bad connecting thing. it together. So it's really hard to push to assemble things because you have to hold it in with your hands and then bend the wires and then thought on where they're going before you can let go or it'll just fall it, out. It's just a frame. It's just a headache. Touching. Just a headache. So for everybody, it, and I'm not saying, I'm not saying use this board F. I'm saying EPL has these. I told them to order the nice boards so that soldering is easier for everybody. I don't care what you solder it to. Um, if you want to turn a PCB like Jasmine did, that's fine too, but it's risky. Am I know? Explain why? Anybody, yes? You make one mistake. If you make a mistake, you have to have the board refabricated, which can take a week. Depending on the mistake. So it depends on when you make the mistake. Or what mistake it is, because you can technically cut down you can if it's you've if you've designed your board well enough. If you made a super compact thing and you try oh. to dig down, are you sure you're digging down and you're not hitting anything else? Not very good. It's real hard. If you spread the thing out and nothing's overlapping anything else, then yeah, you could get away with it. But you still have ground planes under, underneath. When you're trying to dig down, do you mean like you drill? You drill. I've had to or do that. Exacto I've had to do that with boards. What? Or exacto knife, depending on what. You can dig with it. You can just kind of keep keep scraping with an exacto knife, and you'll eventually make it through, and you can get down to the layer. It's it's tedious. It's not fun. You don't want to do it, but it's possible. And I know this because I used to remember I used to be my own rework technician, and there were times when I forgot to connect two things, and there was no pad available for it. It was just a signal that went up to the top layer for a little bit and went back down, and I had to scrape away at the solder mask without cutting the copper. The solder mask is what makes the circuit more green, right? Mm -hmm. And it's really, really thin, kind of plasticky layer, but it's, it's like tough resin. It's not, it's not like saran wrap where it's really easy. So you scrape enough away at it and it exposes the copper, and then I could really gently solder a teeny tiny wire and then solder it where it needed to go. Is this something that would be better done with a Dremel than a... No, Dremel's way too rough. A Dremel will go through, the, it'll go, I mean, you're trying to solder, you're trying to scrape off uh, you're familiar with the, the measurement of a mill, a thousandth of an inch? Solder mask, solder mask is, it's a common, it's an imperial term and, um, yeah, where it's, it's ridiculous, but most rework, or most, um, in the States anyway, most fabrication shops are going to deliver everything in imperial, so you're going to get all your measurements in mill. So the solder mask on a PCB is about 1.4 mils thick. If you're using one ounce copper pores, so how the thickness of your copper on the top layer is also about 1.4 to 1.6 mils thick. So with a Dremel, do you feel like you could shave off 1.4 mils without without going any deeper than that and not cutting the trace? It's nothing. Yeah. It's nothing. It's really hard to do. Okay, uh, and EPL is great, but sometimes limited selection. In industry, you won't have an EPL to buy from. You'll need to order from the same place as most commercial places do. Digikey and Mauser are the two most prominent in the States anyway. So definitely familiar, familiarize yourself with the search functions on each site if you've never used them. More than likely, you'll have to order a couple parts from DigiKey this term. Um, I've tried to minimize that because last year when I taught this course, we were sort of stuck and people were sitting on their hands because we're like waiting on parts from DigiKey. And it was during the holidays at that time. Um, so things were getting slow. So I've tried to make sure Ed orders the stuff that we were hung up on the most, which is this particular type of diode we're gonna use but that doesn't mean that everything will be available for you. Um, just like last time, there's a gift part I'm gonna give you guys. It's a really fancy filter. Um, and I, uh, we'll get to that part later. 
Um, but there's another gift this term, you're welcome. Um, and other than that, you. if you want like a big fancy knob, um, you'll have to buy that yourself um, or have some, you know, if you want to order parts, I don't know, and, and bring them into the EPL, you guys can poke Ben, but I don't want to sign you up for that either. Yeah. Okay. Some parts are better just to have on hand. Um, most of you guys have this stuff already. Um, we are going to have lab days just like we had before, but uh, everybody should have their own resistor kits and pack capacitor kits, maybe even basic diode kits are really handy to have this term. Um, some wire strippers, um, metal tweezers, stuff like that. Um, if you don't have your own banana cables and um, plugs, look at you guys, make sure you have those this term. I'm not going to be wheeling my giant cart around most days when we have lab days uh, because I, I built a home lab and now that lives at home now. Um, so make sure you have your own cables um, to connect stuff with. I will, if you don't have them, Amazon has them for usually They're so cheap. I bought most of my stuff on Amazon. Yeah, too. Yeah. Yeah. And not to shit on the EPL, it's way cheaper than the EPL. Do just be cautious. We have bought some things from Amazon that are terrible things. True, so. true. You can buy total <laughs> crap from Amazon. <laughs> we might not be the cheapest, but it will at least work. Um, so I'm going to give you the schematic just like I did last term. I'll give you the schematic. It'll be an LT Spice thing um, that you can run, and you can obviously also, you know, edit it. You you may find that some things are wrong. They're intentionally wrong, or they're not necessarily wrong, but maybe, hey, maybe that amplifier doesn't need to be there at all. I can just connect the input to the output, and I don't need that whole part. Or maybe that amplifier needs to go somewhere else. Hint, hint. Um, so I'm going to give you a schematic and say here is the parts you'll need. You should be able to pull out which parts you need. Mostly, it's going to be 3904s. Um, you can use the MPQs, I recommend them, but it's not as crucial this term as it was last. It wasn't even that crucial last term. Everybody used it, that was fine. Um, but they are a $5 part and you'll need at least two of them. So you'll need at least eight transistors, eight 3904s. And again, if they're all matched, that's nice. Uh, there's a bunch of pairs that get loaded around when you build the Gilbert cell. It's, if you build a Gilbert cell, which you will, it's the first part of the project, project um, it's three, diff pair, three matched pairs. To, to build a Gilbert cell. Um, so if you have two MPQs, then you have all those parts. <clears throat> so as analog students, I said, this is this is before we knew about the MPQs being super available. I said buy about 20 30 nano fours and 30 nano sixes. Why 20 when we only need eight? Because you burn them out, as you all know. Um, so if you buy a stripper and you buy them all still in the reel, or they're, on, they're connected to the paper and not just a loose bag of them, the chances that they are not necessarily matched, but all kind of close to sort of quasi-matched um, are higher if they're on the same reel because they probably came from the same wafer. If they were matched, they were neighbors on the wafer. And we don't really know if they were neighbors just because they're neighbors on the strip, but it's more likely that they have more in common than if they were just random things. Um, match pairs are great. They get a little spendy. Like we all know it's five bucks. They do have a ton of them in the EPL because Ed ordered a bunch. We won't need any of the 2907s this term. So it's all 3904, uh, which is nice. Uh, and if you complain about how much all this costs, just remember I didn't make you buy a textbook for this course. And any textbooks I talk about, I'm just going to, until they yell at me and I don't know, uh, I'll just give you PDFs of pirated stuff. Nobody should complain, right? Textbooks are a scam. Um, FT37-43s uh, are handy. <laughs> Normally you would use them to make a transformer we are going to use them to make an inductor. So the shitty thing about inductors is that you'll need a value that it doesn't come in. So what I'll tell you is just make one. And you can get, there's calculators online. We'll get to that point when we talk about filters again. There's calculators online. And then if you say, hey, I have an FT37-43, which just means it's a ferrite toroid. It's 0.37 inches outer diameter. And the, the mix of ferrite versus ceramic in it is number 43. There's FT50s, which are half inch. There's FT106, which is 1.06 inches, so you get the idea. Um, and there's all different kinds of codes. Sometimes it's just a T, sometimes it's an FT. Depends on if there's a lot of ferrite or if it's just a lot of um, ceramic. And they all have different properties. So you can go shopping and you like, well, if I have 20 turns around this toroid, I can get the, the inductance I need. Or if I do 600 turns around this one, well, I would, ra I would rather wrap 20 turns around an inductor than 600, right? And sometimes you can't get 600 turns of wire around the thing, so you kind of have to go picking. But I know they have the 3743s in the EPL because they're in there from last year. 
Wrapping wire is also really nice to have. Wrapping wire, or sometimes it's called, it's called magnet wire. Um, if you look at a DC motor, if you think about like the coils in there, it's that orangey kind of wire. The orangey stuff is an enamel coating. I think you guys were looking at it last term. Uh, when you were building the jewel thieves last term, that was wrapping wire around those things. Um, those are nice to have for the same reasons. Um, you're going to be wrapping it as tight as you can, and uh, you'll have the, less, the least flux leakage um, if you have to build your own inductor. Hopefully, we can massage the circuit so you have to build as few inductors as possible, but I'm not going to say that you'll never do it. <clears throat> okay, lecture time, yeah? Is a toroid with just one wire inductor? Yeah. Good question. Okay, this is actually the lecture, lecture one. <clears throat> so small signals versus weak signals. In analog circuits, we talk um, about small signal design, and we say that small signals are smaller than VT. What's VT, if you remember from your, your circuits classes? It's Boltzmann's constant times temperature in Kelvin over Q, where Q is um, the charge of one electron. And we know at room temperature, it's about 26-ish millivolts. That's just kind of like your textbook answer for what a VT is. So a small signal amplifier might have an input signal of one millivolt, right? One millivolt smaller than VT at 26. And an output signal of 10 millivolts, gain of 10, right? And we expect that output signal to be a linear function of the input signal, most simply described by multiplying it, right? We want to say if I give it two millivolts, I should get 20 out, right? I want it to be linear. If I give it 10 millivolts, I should get 100 millivolts out. In truth, that's not the case. There becomes a point, we talked about compression last term. At some point, it stops being linear. We're not gonna talk about, we're, since we're talking about small signal models, we don't really worry about compression unless it's a really crappy uh, inductor. So less than a millivolt is about the smallest signal we can display on an oscilloscope. And I would challenge that the ones that we have in the capstone lab probably can't see one millivolt very well either. Um, so, sig sorry, uh, it, this is kind of the reason we're gonna introduce signal generator, or sorry, spectrum analyzers this term, because we're gonna be looking at small stuff. It's gonna be less than a millivolt. Looking at it on a scope, you're, never, you're not gonna see anything. But on a spectrum analyzer, you can. So in contrast, one millivolt is a huge signal to a radio receiver, it's a lot. Like if you have a millivolt coming in after all of your LNA filtering is done, that's plenty, you have a lot to work with. It's not gonna blow it up unless it's like an astrophysics kind of thing, um, but it's plenty. So we're, we're gonna be measuring signals, we're gonna be working with signals and that are so small you can't see them on the scope. <clears throat> uh, a weak signal is much, much stronger the one millivolt at the antenna receive terminals. Later we'll examine, uh, and that's at the terminals, right? If we're thinking about, uh, for those of you who took EMAG and antennas and stuff like that, remember there's a spreading loss. If I have a transmitter on top of a hill and I wanna go 10 miles with it, it's spread out 10 miles with one over four pi r squared, where r is 10 miles, right? The amount of signal actually getting to that, that antenna is tiny, there's not much voltage. Um, so we're gonna talk about the weakest signals that we can recover. So how weak can it be before we don't see it? Hey, Juan. Okay, so Boltzmann constant relates the amount of random energy in something, a gas particle, electron, and a solid, as a function of temperature. We refer to the, temperature, or the energy a vibrating electron has as its thermal energy. Right? Everything, everything in this room is vibrating because it's hot. And at zero degrees Kelvin, everything, it's absolute zero, everything stops moving. But anything above zero degrees Kelvin is moving somewhat. Boltzmann's constant is what's telling us how much is it moving. And in radio engineer, engineering, we use the dimensional analysis to write joules as watt seconds, and then note that hertz is one over seconds. So in other words, Boltzmann's constant gives us power in watts per Kelvin per hertz, where hertz is the bandwidth of the signal we want to recover. So what would be these, if we're talking about audio, what would be the bandwidth of the signal of audio at, at most for human hearing? 10 kilohertz? Yeah, it's a little, theoretically you like could go up to 20. 20. 20. 20 is the absolute maximum, right? We can't, human ears can't hear past 20 kilohertz. Most of us can't hear past 15. But theoretically someone can, I don't know. Um, but in general, if we're talking about AM radios, it's only 5K. 
That's why, uh, that's why AM radio doesn't sound that great, because it's bandwidth limited. So you only hear things up to 5K and then you don't hear anything anymore. And it's great for speech, bad for music. Okay, here's my plug for this calculator, which uh, Juan and Ben are the only ones who haven't seen this, so I get to talk about it again. <clears throat> so if you're in this class, you're late in your EE student lives, but I use this calculator all the time um, to make chili. Um, I use it to make all kinds of stuff. So I have a, um, I measured my jar of cumin, of ground cumin, and I said, oh, it's two, two millimeters in diameter and it's about eight millimeters tall on the inside. How many cups is that? Because I need one little spice jar and I need a third a cup of chili every time and I don't want to pour the whole thing out in a cup just to have to try to pour it back in again. So is that enough? And this calculator can do watts, sorry, watts, it can do unit analysis. So I can multiply pi r squared times, you know, I can calculate the area of this cylinder and say, I've got this much cumin, is that more or less than a third of a cup? Do I need to buy a spice jar of cumin every time I make chili? Uh, yes, I do, actually. Every six times I make chili, I, I can get away with not buying one if I save this little tiny little bit as I go. It takes like five sixths of a, of a container. And usually I just dump it all in. Anyway, if you've got a TI-89 or a 92, it has the same functionality, it's just slower. The TI-89 came out when I was in high school, and that was 1999 when I graduated, I'm old. Um, so, and it was a simpler black and white display. But the Inspire, TI Inspire CAS, that's the important part, CAS. If you don't have CIS, CAS, it won't do stuff, It'll, your software locked out. They do the whole BMW thing. Has everybody seen the BMW heated seats BS? Yes. Where they sell you a car mm -hmm. and it's got heated seats, but you can't use that feature unless you pay them. Um, it's the same situation with, with this. It's probably the same hardware and they just lock it out the software, call it a different model. But it's a $140 calculator. I'm not saying buy a $140 calculator and no, it's not required. But if you buy it on the app store, it's only 30 bucks and it's faster actually. Sorry, um, what, what, if you don't buy the CAS version, you have to buy the CAS version. If it doesn't say CAS, you're locked out. They're actually different colors too. So the CAS version is black with blue sides. I think the other one's um, like green sides or something. It's a different color. Um, it's very handy. I use it to calculate things like let's say, let's calculate the power of a single electron at room temperature and a bandwidth of one hertz, and let's calculate how many dBm that is, how many watts is that? And we're gonna do it in watts and dBm because it's gonna be obviously a teeny tiny little number. And the best way to describe teeny tiny little numbers is in decibels. And remember that dBm is a decibel relative to one milliwatt, right? You have a question? No. Okay, saying. cool. So we can also say, assuming a 50 ohm input and output, we can calculate the voltage once we know the power, we can just divide all that out, and the calculator will actually do that for you. You don't have to keep track of all your units and your divide by uh, 10 to the blah, blah, blah. It does it all for you because you can just input milliwatts, um, or you can kiloohms or microhenries, and it knows all this stuff. And what's nice is if you use units all the time to solve things out, your answers will come back in the units you expect, and if they don't, you know you screwed something up, and you, maybe you input things wrong and you can go back and check your work before you just start blindly moving forward with some value that's like a thousand times too big or you have like farad newtons because you, you got some weird unit conversion that went on because you put some things in the wrong order. Um, so the calculator can do this kind of stuff. <clears throat> so noise floor, this is kind of relating to KTV. I don't know if you can see this very well. Um, these are the same plots. And on one, we've got a visual bandwidth. That's what this DBW is. This is what we see on the screen. Visual bandwidth of 300 hertz. And it is, this line here, this, this noise floor is about an 80, uh, negative 80 decibels. And if we expand that, we, we, we increase that to 100 kilohertz, which is about 30 times more bandwidth, right? Our noise floor rises a little over 10 dB. And you notice you have these little weak signals here, and you can almost not make them out now. In fact, this one you can see, Actually, that's noise, that's not even it. That's some other signal, that's not the same signal. And you can't even see those signals. Oh no, sorry, that is, it's just shifted, sorry. But you can see these two signals, but these other two little guys here and here are gone. They're buried into the noise floor. And that's because we've set our bandwidth too high. We're scanning for too much. So a lot of times in radio signaling, 
or you're trying to recover a really weak signal, let's say like GPS. GPS comes from outer space, literally, and it comes in at a negative 154-ish dBm, which is, there's not even a name for that in voltage or watts. There's not a, you know, it's, it's less than an atto watt. It's, it's just isn't a name, they use a dBm. If you wanna find that on a spectrum analyzer, you have to set a window so small, you have to know exactly where that, that, that window is to even start getting a plot to see, your, to see your bandwidth. If you try to sweep the entire spectrum, then because of KTB, remember K, Boltzmann's constant, temperature, which is in a lab you can't control, and it's always hotter in the lab than we want it to be, the only thing you have control over is your bandwidth. So if you want to look at a VNA, for example, and you're looking at a log mag plot in VNA, and you're trying to see stuff, and you set it from its lowest setting to the maximum, you can't really see a lot. You have to window it in and window it in and window it in, because what you're also missing out is how many samples are there per window. And I don't care what's happening at 200 kilohertz if this is a 70 gigahertz signal. So I don't, I don't need to set that window. So again, KTB, I say K sub B for, to say, make sure everybody knows we're talking about Boltzmann's constant, but I'll say verbally KTB, is the total thermal noise power, which is what establishes our noise floor. It's called the thermal noise power because for a given bandwidth, temperature is the only variable. So if we're saying, I wanna see this band, I want, show me the AM band, right? That's 540 to 1700 kilohertz. That's my band. The only thing I can change, Boltzmann's constant is a constant by definition. The only thing I can change is its temperature. So why do you think, let's say, astrophysicists put their observatories on top of a mountain in Chile? It's cold as shit up there, right? It's really cold, and if you're trying to receive a signal from outer space, you don't know what band to pick from, so they're gonna pick one and listen, and then move, and listen, and listen, and listen. And they're gonna do it in little steps at a time because they can only look at a small amount of bandwidth at a time because the universe has a cosmic background radiation of some finite value. And if it's weaker than that, we can't recover it. And Earth has an atmosphere which is many degrees above zero Kelvin, and that adds noise, so we get it as cold as we can and hope. Uh, so anyway, this gives us a noise floor in our spectrum analyzer. We'll talk about spectrum analyzers in more in detail um, as we actually start using them. Um, but if it's weaker than the noise floor, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to detect. It's not always impossible. Again, you can always window down, you can filter, there's tricks you can do on, this, on the spectrum analyzers that have um, toys for that, if you know exactly where the signal is you're trying to find. But if you're just sort of looking at it and say, where's my signal, uh, it's a little harder to use. So if you're trying to find a weak signal, like I said, restrict your video bandwidth to where the signal is to lower the noise floor. Or take the spectrum analyzer outside for the cold environment, but you can't do that with our equipment because it's chained to the disk. Um, yeah? I've seen the term video bandwidth in video with something artificially to store. What does that mean? Um, there's two types of bandwidth you can set. You can set an, inter uh, an IF bandwidth, which is how, how, how many bits it scans at a time. And that, that will be how many, it's sort of like a, a Nyquist polling rate. How often do you, that's a bandwidth type. The video bandwidth is where am I starting and stopping? And that's, they call it video bandwidth because that's what's shown in the video display. <clears throat> okay. So weak signals at receiver inputs. So the simplest model for a radio receiver is just an amplifier with lots and lots and lots of gain, right? If the input signal is one nanovolt and we want millivolt, one millivolt for the input to some, let's say it's some analog to digital converter, we call them ADCs, then we need a voltage gain of, of a million, 10 to the six, right? That's a nice thought experiment, <clears throat> but totally impractical. An amplifier with a gain of 10 million, or one million, will, will find a way to oscillate. Um, so it's going to oscillate the output here, um, but let's just not worry about that for a second. If we imagine that our receiver with a gain of a million is just an amplifier and not an oscillator, we're waving our hands here, we're saying this is magic, then we can connect an AC voltmeter to the output. So I've got my AC voltmeter to the output and to ground, right? I did have fun drawing this, by the way, if you're gonna ask. Um, then we can connect that AC voltmeter and measure when there's a 50 ohm resistor at the input, right? We need some kind of input resistance and we can measure the output. And we can see we've got one volt AC on that output. That's not AC because it's an oscillator, it's AC because that's the signal that we've amplified. 
That's an important distinction. Now, if we cool that resistor to half of room temperature, we expect to see the power drop in half, which means the reading on our voltmeter should be 0.707 times what it was at room temperature. Why 0.707? It's a number you'll start remembering in RF and analog a lot. No, nope. it's it's one specific number divided by another specific number. Square root of two over two. I'm sorry. It's the square root of two over two. And why is it square root of two? Because voltage is power squared and we halved it. Sorry, sorry, voltage squared over the set resistance is power. And then if we're cutting our power in half, because we cut the temperature in half. Everybody following? Cool. Is that related to RMS? Root mean square? No. Um, so if, if you have if you've got a, a one watt system over 50 ohms, how much is that in voltage, right? You have some voltage squared over 50 that equals that equals um, the one watt, right? So to solve for V, you act, there's a square root of two in there, right? So what are, it's you're taking the square root of of your voltage, um, which is why when we cut the power in half, our voltmeter is root two divided by two. So we're not cutting the voltage in half because that would cut the power by a quarter, to a quarter. We're only cutting it to square root of two over two, which is 0.707. Because square root of two is 1.412 or something like that. Mm. Okay, so it's hard to lower a 50 ohm resistor to an arbitrary and convenient temperature like half of room temperature, but relatively easy to lower the temperature to around 77 Kelvin if you have friends like Nima does in the physics department and you have access to liquid nitrogen out of your Stanley Cup. <laughs> you can get them. So if instead of cutting the power in half, we go to 77, and let's assume we have a perfect receiver again. This is, this is our imaginary fictitious bullshit. The noise power output, the noise output power drops by 0.26. So again, it's just KTB. There's our, we still have our one hertz bandwidth. And we've reduced our noise by almost 75%, right? That's pretty cool. So our voltmeter reading varies as the square root of power change. So the voltage, in this case, drops from one millivolt to half a millivolt AC, roughly. So because we almost cut, we cut it by 75%, roughly. So then the power does cut in half. And that's just a coincidence in this case, um, because we went to 77K from 295. So using a sensitive radio receiver to measure the temperature of distant things, like the cosmic background radiation of the universe, is a vast, wonderful field of experimental science that we don't cover. Um, it is cool, um, but the fundamentals are hot things noisy, cold things quiet. Right? Um, if you've got a hot receiver, uh, if you've got a hot part, and you're trying to make a really quiet receiver. Put a heat sink on it, right? So further refinements. Um, so the calculations in the last two slides are BS, kind of, not really. Um, so our theoretical receiver isn't perfect. Obviously, it's theoretical. Um, and the actual change in output power of the receiver is less than the change of the temperature of the 50 ohm resistor. Remember, we, we cooled the resistor to half, but our output power um, isn't always going to be exactly that, uh, that perfect number. So the problem is that the noise isn't all coming from the thermal motion of electrons in the resistor. Some of it's coming from the transmission line connecting the receiver to the receiver input. Some of it's the receiver itself. Each of those is multiplied by the gain, which is still our absurd 10 million or 10 to the sixth value or 1 million. Um, so it's not that you can just cool one part. You can't just cool one resistor and instantly have perfect noise. You gotta cool everything, right? That's why the entire observatory is on the mountaintop in Chile and not just one special park. And for those of you wondering, you can't put it in outer space because satellites get hot. Anybody in PSAS will tell you that. Um, there's nowhere for the heat to go. There's no air. Um, so it, things get hot. And actually, things get very hot uh, in outer space as far as our electronics do. Um, so if it's, this, or it's as if the source of the extra noise in the receiver, aside from the noise in the resistor, is another fictional resistor at a temperature that doesn't change when we cool off that 50 ohm resistor. It's like there's another resistor inside, and even though we cooled the one off, that one stayed warm, and so there's more noise. Let's call that fictional resistor's thermal noise, TR. 
And now we'll complete our expression from the last slide. And we can say that we have 77K plus whatever this TR times my gain over the same thing at the, old, at the room temperature plus whatever this resistor value is, we're multiplying everything by the gain and we get just some value Y. <clears throat> we can rearrange those terms to obtain an unknown receiver equivalent noise temperature, TR, noise temperature being TR, from any measured change in hot to cold AC power output Y, which is very wordy, we'll get it. So TR is this guy. We've just solved for TR. If the difference between our receiver noise power output with the external 50 ohm source at room temperature and a liquid nitrogen temperature is some Y value, I just made this number up probably because it makes the math pretty, um, then our TR is 50 degrees Kelvin. So we say we have a 50 degree Kelvin system. We are, it's not that the device itself is 50 ohms, we're just sort of calling it, um, kind of like when you say this is a one watt amplifier, you expect that the output power can go up to a watt, but it's not like it's always a watt. It's just a term that we use. And if we have a, we have a 50 Kelvin system and we have a, uh, a 10 K um, Kelvin system, if Y is this other value. Both are really quiet, but this one is exceptionally quiet. This one belongs in our observatory in Chile. The other one, maybe not. Maybe, you know, it depends on where you're gonna draw the line of what is good, right? If you're building headphones and you have a particular audio system um, and you're an audiophile and you have really nice headphones, and then you give those to, let's say a concert violinist that needs every little last tone, those really nice um, headphones you use for gaming or playing music for yourself are probably garbage, right? But they're really, it's not that they're bad, they don't meet the job that they need to do. There's always different lines in the sand drawn um, for quality. <clears throat> so now we have three things with noise in, we have three things. We have noise temperature, noise factor, and noise figure. Well, let's demystify those a little bit. So radio scientists, radio astronomers build very sensitive receivers that have little noise and they specify the sensitivity of the receivers using noise temperature. RF engineers working on mass produced equipment like probably you're gonna wind up doing, cell phones, handheld VHF radios, um, they're gonna build very uh, much less sensitive receivers and we're gonna give everything in decibels. So a noise factor can be obtained from noise temperature with this equation. So noise factor calculations are technically only valid when the temperature is 290K and we've been using 295. And mostly that's because my wife's from Phoenix uh, and room temperature at our house is 295 Kelvin as I calculated <laughs> um, because she's a little bird person who gets cold if it drops below 70. But room temperature scientifically is considered 290K. Um, little small values like that don't significantly change the value. It's, it's, it's several decimal points away. It's not that big of a change to make, but technically, um, if you're doing a calculation, you should use 290. Wait. Yeah. Um, that, so wait, that, if we do that calculation and use something other than 290, it just... It changes the value a little bit. If, if you were trying to solve, if you were trying to give, if I gave you a question with noise factors, so calculate the noise factor, and I give you a TR, mm -hmm. and you use 295, and I set the margin of error in Canvas to something absurdly small, you would get it wrong. Mm -hmm. If I set the margin of error to something more forgiving, you probably wouldn't get it wrong. Is there another equation that... Uh... TO should be 290K, mm -hmm. period. That's how it's defined. That's how noise factor is defined. It's kind of like how, yeah. um, that's how oh. like Celsius to Kelvin, there's a number, that's just how it's defined. Okay. Yeah. Noise figure, which is given in decibels, is just simply 10 log of F, and F being noise factor. So for our previous example, uh, a noise temperature of 10 Kelvin gives a noise factor of uh, 0.147 decibels, and 50 Kelvin gives 0.691 decibels. It's just easy math. All these things are convertible between each other. To a communications engineer, a sub-decibel noise figure is pretty good, but to a radio astronomer, expects noise figure less than a tenth of a decibel. Again, everybody draws their lines in different places because sometimes you're looking for an, a, a, a weak signal coming from a different galaxy as opposed to the radio station 20 miles away. So it can be sort of objective. <clears throat> as a brief overview of antennas, most of you have heard my antenna spiels. Um, we touch on antenna fundamentals in EMAG and there was, I know it's not is anymore, um, there was an antennas course offered as a 510 topic. Uh, anybody taken a 510 class? They're really cool. Take 510 classes. None of them are the same thing. 
um, you'll say he, I, I think I took like five different 510. 510 just means it's not an official course yet. And it's, they call them like a topics in. Um, so it's like topics in Devesh's green sweatshirt. And like they'll have a class about that. Um, or it'll be topics and mine was antennas. I took one in RFIC, I took one in um, antenna array processing. Uh, and they're all different, but they're all really interesting because it's sort of a pet project of the faculty who's teaching it. So there's a lot of energy in those classes to, to like learn from. It's, it's not just read the textbook, take the test. <clears throat> so we'll stay in our lane here a bit um, because this can't become an antennas class. We don't have the time, but we can't dodge the topic entirely because we're building a radio. So this woman's tracking foxes um, that were previously caught and fitted with a radio transmitter collar. They got a little transmitter on their collar and it put, pumps out a little weak signal, but we've got to point this antenna and find the fox, <clears throat> find out where they went. So this particular type of antenna, it's called a Yagi Uda antenna, uh, it's Japanese. Uh, everybody's seen them before, they're nothing new, they've been around forever. Um, and based on the uh, dimensions of, of the, the antenna, just kind of eyeballing it and taking some assumptions about her height, it's probably about a 160, 160 megahertz antenna, since each of these, these elements here are a, um, about a quarter wavelength of that, and a quarter wavelength, you know, I think I, I estimated it to be some length just based on what I thought she, how tall she might be, but I can't measure that because I don't know this one. It's a Google image search. So this is the Yagi Uda antenna. <clears throat> the horizontal components are usually insulative. They're fiberglass, they're wood, they're something that's not uh, conductive. So the only things we really care about and stand to for the matter. The only things we care about are this reflector. We have this, um, this loop antenna, it's like a half loop, and then it's got these reflectors, and sometimes there's several of them, these directors. And the Yagiyuda antenna was named after two scientists from Japan. Um, one of them who is upset about the fact that they just called it a Yagi, um, and Professor Yuda is probably a little pissy about that, but they're dead, so you probably care more. The transmission line to the receiver connects with a folded dipole driven element which is just a fancy way of saying it's a dipole in electrical length, but we folded it so it's not as bulky as it might otherwise be. There's tons of trade-offs on why you would use a folded dipole instead of a real dipole, one of them being size. <clears throat> you don't have to take photos of this because these slides will all be there. I mean, you can take photos if you want. The other two wires to the right are reflectors, and there's a really cool Canadian Air Force um, video you can find on YouTube that's awesome. comedy. Um, for the special effects they use, because this is well before computers, but they have CGI, it's kind of animated CGI. Uh, but it is a very informative video, it's really good. Um, I'll put a link to it, yeah. What's the function of dipole? Dipole is just a type of antenna. So this dipole is, if this was a straight dipole, it would kind of have like a donut shaped reflection. Like, but that's not very directive. If I wanted to point it, how do you point a donut, right? You don't. So what you do is you cut the back of the donut off and you, you fold it over and you put it on the top. Now my donut sort of points one way. And then if I space these off at particular intervals, it reflects in um, the way the geometry works. Again, I'll show you, the, I'll put the video up. It's, it's a five minute watch, but it explains it really, really, really well. Um, if I have these reflectors at these particular points along the curve, it actually folds that in even more. And now I have a really pointable and I can scan. And if I move this thing physically around, I can scan for something that I'm looking for. So the directors are in limiting now. How do you differentiate direction versus bandwidth and all those other parameters? What is it doing to the wave if you're changing direction? I can feed it. I have my signal inputting here, and then down here I can feed it out of phase. I can feed it uh, 180 degrees out of phase. So by the time it gets from here to here, it's pulsed again, and now I've doubled that its strength, and then another 180 degrees out of phase and another half wavelength away, it pulses again because it's because this is 180 out of phase with this, which is 180 out of phase out of this, which means these two are in phase, right? And you can keep doing that and you just keep adding and adding. It's kind of like, um, like a conveyor belt, like it comes along and you just kind of hit it at just the right time and bing and bing, it keeps going and going and going and propagating in that one direction and, and all other directions the interference sort of cancels it out and it, it gets a little fuzzy. But in that one direction, the more of those reflectors or directors you have, um, then you have a lot more power in that direction. Um, you have a lot, they call it directivity, and it's relative to the gain of the antenna. Those two things are, are um, 
proportional to each other. <clears throat> and this is just a reflector because we only want the stuff to go this way. So this is just usually a big flat thing. But <clears throat> AM radio antennas. Uh, so next week we'll be designing the first building blocks to a class project. Um, I'll put that up. You should start building your mixer early before you know what the mixer does. It's actually one of the easier things to build. It, it's a test circuit. If it doesn't work, you built it wrong. There's not any playing with it. It just works. Um, it should be, after last term, you'll, you'll find it pretty easy to put together. <clears throat> so the AM band is 540 kilohertz to 1700 kilohertz. And a quarter wavelength in air is about 45 to 140 meters. So we're not building Yagis for that because they won't fit in the door. You probably wouldn't fit in the hall. It wouldn't fit in the elevator. You couldn't get it in the room, right? Using a patch or a dipole, all these textbook antennas are completely unreasonable to build in this frequency because of their size. Um, and we don't need to. We have an AM radio in our cars, and we don't need football field, football field size antennas to receive that signal. We just aren't receiving it as well as it's been transmitted, right? They're transmitted by giant uh, towers up on the hill by my house. Maybe not AM, but the FM ones are. Um, and there are some AM radio stations up there. But <clears throat> If you're up in the West Hills, you've seen those big giant towers with the red blinking lights so planes don't hit them. Those are your transmitting antennas. But you don't need that to receive it. You're just only receiving a teeny, teeny, tiny portion of power. But that's what we build receivers for. We were going to amplify that power. We're going to process the data out of it. And then we're going to play right wing AM radio because that's all it's on AM, unfortunately. Um, we found that out last year, by the way. We were going to like, oh, yeah, we're going to receive some actual radio. And then the problem was twofold. One, you're in the capstone lab, and AM radio doesn't penetrate to the basement because of the wavelength um, rules um, that most of you heard about last term, um, or waveguide, rather. Um, and second, there's nothing to listen to on AM radio. It's all right-wing weirdos and um, a couple, I guess there's some Spanish uh, sports channels. So if you speak Spanish, uh, then you like sports, maybe you can pick one of those stations. Uh, we are probably not going to pick up a station. We aren't even going to build an antenna because there's no point. If you want to build an antenna, by the way, an antenna is hilariously easy to build. You can just plug it in and it should pick up your signal. Um, if, you're, if you're building this for your, um, for your interviews, you want to bring your, your project in. In fact, you can just take a wire and a rock and tie <laughs> the wire around the rock and go find a big tree and hook that rock over the tree and then connect that wire to your system. And that is an antenna that you can use for AM radio. AM radio is so strong that it, it, everything will pick it up. Um, you'll probably get 960 or 1060. Uh, 1080 is a really strong one that isn't right wing radio. Um, 1080 is the one I use in all my examples because of that reason. Uh, we can just filter and amplify any weak signal, even with a non ideal antenna, right? So things want to be antennas. It's really hard to build an antenna that doesn't work. It's a little more challenging to build one that meets some, spe some spec. Um, we built the patch antenna out of copper wire or copper tape uh, last term. Um, and all of them work. Some of them work fantastically well, right? <clears throat> so as long as the signal's above the noise floor, we just pick up everything and just process out the noise on our end. Ideally, we can window it in so that the antenna only works at one frequency or we filter it and things like that, and we can make our lives a little easier. If we were transmitting AM, we have a whole host of other problems, um, the FCC not being the least of them. Um, if you had a non-ideal antenna, though, you would, you would have a real problem getting your transmission to go as far as it should. For our project, um, I said I'll supply the antenna. I just bought an AM loop, um, if you really want. They're six bucks on Amazon. Um, and it really is just a loop of wire on a plastic frame. <laughs> um, they're, they're, not, they're not expensive. If you've got a, a loop, that, that's fine, too, if you want to use it. But for the actual class, the requirements of the class, we won't need the antenna at all. <clears throat> okay, so that is the end of this lecture. Um, I can start the next one if you guys are into it, with the caveat that you will probably see it many, many times because I believe the next one is about mixers and we will be beating that horse to death, which I'm honestly okay with. We have 50 mi or 40 minutes. Uh, can minute. you upload or open the circuit so we can see the LP spikes? Uh, not, I can't open it because I didn't bring oh, a laptop sorry. and this is the school computer. Or just. But um, I can publish it. Thank you. Okay. That's it may not be the final version. Yeah. Okay. But you'll get the idea. Yeah, I'll ballpark. You mentioned that um, radio being cared to be um, signals. 
signal signal rather than the carrier signal. Uh, the data signal was always was frequency. Is that only for FM or also for AM? Uh, most carriers have have a uh, Bluetooth. It's 2.4 gigahertz. Right, I thought AM though basically works by changing the. It does. Amplitude. Don't confuse the modulation pipe with the carrier though. It always is on a carrier. It's always just sitting on some channel. So when you tune your AM radio or your FM radio and you turn it to a channel, if you're on the Buzz 107.5, you're tuning your radio to 170.5 megahertz. That's the carrier. Right. And then they fuck with that signal, the, and and you, the, your 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 car radio receiver knows. Oh, I'm being messed with. Here's how much I'm being messed with. And we can output that as an error. You can call it an error if you want. But really, it's your it's your data. It's your audio. I, my impression was that with FM, they're messing with the frequency. They are. And AM, they're messing with the amplitude. That is exactly what they stand for. Oh, OK. I, sorry, the explanation you gave made me think that. Nope, that's fine. All right, so I'm going to publish okay. today's lecture. Mm -hmm. I should publish the module. Uh, let's publish this so you guys can see it. I'm going to publish Spice. And then I need to publish. Um, the reason I say it may not be done is because I don't think the zip file, let's actually look. I used the 5532 op amp, and I gave you the spice model for it, but I don't think you actually have my model. Oh. Um, and I need to re upload it. Yeah. So you don't actually have my model for the 5532, so it won't actually fit. Um, so I need to re upload this. But if you ignore the, um, if, you, if you open this and you just look at the, um, <coughs> The mixer section. It's 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 in a dotted line that says this is your mixer. Um, that's what you're going to build for project one. Um, you'll see it again here too. I'll put it, I think I have it on a slide. <clears throat> um, you shouldn't need any of the parts that have the the 5532 in it, and then I'll put the other ones up later with the models included. Um, also, in this file, by the way, if you try to simulate it, it will take a long time. It's because it includes the entire project. It also has last term's project in it. So mm -hmm. if you, um, for Juan and Ben, and Marissa when she shows up, um, three people who weren't in the last time, um, there was a project, there's an audio amplifier in there. It's quite big. You don't have to build that. It's in the Spice model. Um, but that's what they built last term. It's, yeah, it's mostly, yeah. If I wanted to rebuild last term's, I won't stop you. Use a regular op amp instead of the crap one. Crap one use. Um, I would uh, an LM three fifty eight is great. With the caveat that I'll say, not that it's wrong, but a lot of people mess up and they think that a three fifty eight is an op amp. It is not. It's a little baby audio amplifier, but it's not an op amp. So it doesn't have the same rules. It often is drawn like it's an op amp. It's a triangle, right, with pins, but it's not actually an op-amp, so you can't treat it like it is. So you have to read the data sheet to find out this is how you change the game, this is how you do this. Or you could just use a 5532, which is an op-amp. It's actually two op-amps. Um, and that would be, the complementary symmetry output just works. Unless you connect something wrong or burn it out, um, that just works. The hard part is, um, is the op-amp part. Because honestly, the, the diff-amp we used was very, very simple. Um, and it, because it's simple, it didn't have a lot of variability, and you had to tune things just right. Um, I burned out my heat, and that's why mine wasn't working. I finally figured it out. And then, thankfully, I remember because we only used two P and P's, I just took took it out, flipped it upside down, and used the other side, and then started working. I'm like, oh, I didn't just to burn them out. What um, What was the part you said was an audio amplifier, not an oh, oh. LM358. Yeah. Uh, and why did this data sheet say industry standard dual operational amplifier? That's a good question. Huh. <clears throat> that it's not an op amp. Uh, for the magnet wire, what gauge is normal for that? 28 to 32. Oh, 20. Ish. Okay. Smaller ish. Okay. <clears throat> let's see what I got in this next lecture. What do we have? Oh yeah. Okay. Let's 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 jump into this. We'll, we'll see this again anyway. <clears throat> I'll just start this slide over again, but you'll get a you'll get a sneak peek. So here's the AM band. Um, it's really weak um, um, because it's a background image, but this is actually a spectrum plot of the AM band. So you see, you got all these little channels in here, and they're all different strengths, right? And the reason they're different strengths is because every single AM band station that exists that we can pick up here, they're either not broadcasted around here where we can receive them, 
or they're, you know, some of these are in John Day, Oregon. Some of these are just up the hill by my house. Some of these are clear out in Gresham. So they're all coming in at different strengths and weaknesses and things like that. <clears throat> and that's normal. Each channel is 10 kilohertz apart from the next. Obviously not all of them are shown in the image here. Uh, by the way, this image shows it better um, when there's not fucking light in front of it. But <clears throat> if you want to tune to a channel, you might just build an exceedingly narrow adjustable bandcast filter to isolate just that channel. So we might go, I want this channel, so I'm gonna build a filter that only covers that, and then I just, I'll, I'll, that's my dad, right? And that could work. Um, and we can demodulate, amplify, listen to the data in that signal. And the data and the signal for AM radio is just audio, right? If you wanted to select an AM channel, we have to build a filter for each channel. So the problem with filters is that we can make them exceedingly narrow and cool, but then they're sort of fixed in that frequency. You can't just turn a knob and change all the properties about it at once and have it shift around. So I can build one really nice narrow filter, but now I can't move it. So if I wanted to select an AM channel, now I'm saying, well, maybe we build one for every channel. There's 117 channels. So. Remember, if your final exam, you just did a fifth order low pass filter with real parts and acceptable insertion loss. Now do it again as a band pass filter, several, order higher, several orders higher, and do it 116 times in a row, right? Seem reasonable? No. Anybody doing it for a project? No, thank That's you. your final. No, it's not. Um, somehow switch between each filter to select channel, and just this is all just to listen to AM radio, which no one wants to hear in the first place, right? right. So here is the super hip radio block diagram probably its most basic form. This is precisely what we're building, except for this. We did this last term. <clears throat> so we designed these sections in 421 to some degree. We talked about filters and amplifiers. Um, and then we built a very specific one um, here. An IF filter is something I'm going to be giving you. That's your gift this term. It's a crystal filter, and it's very specific. Um, sorry, for what it's worth, what kind of filter is that? Who remembers the block diagrams? Bandpass. Bandpass. Band pass. What about that one? It's an AC source. Yes, thank you. Trick question. It's not a filter. These guys are bandpass filters. That's not. Wait, but so if you have a filter, you have you have a high, a medium, and a sorry, and a low, but they have lines through them. So this is blocking low and high. So it's a, a oh. bandpass, and this is just a wiggle. So it's just an oscillator. Sometimes people draw, can you see if I write over here? Yeah. Okay. Sometimes people do low pass, because that's what it looks like in a Bodhi plot, ideally, right? And sometimes people do low pass. They're interchangeable. You'll see them both ways. The low one doesn't have, the lowest one doesn't have the strike through it, so it passes, right? So a band pass would look like this, right? And a high pass would look like that. I like band pass and high pass. You'll see them both ways. I have my preferences. If I draw it on the board, it's probably one of these. But when you um, steal images from Wikipedia, um, I'm not going to go in there and change this for, um, in, in this, so that's what happened. It is from Wikipedia. <clears throat> this dotted line, though, indicates that this filter and this oscillator are adjusted at the same time. And I said, ah, someone's, Nick, yeah, you're full of shit. You said you can't adjust filters. This is the filter we don't adjust. This is the super, super, super narrow one. This is an RF filter. This is other terms. We'll talk about it in the next, uh, in a lecture or two. You can make a filter that adjusts a little bit. You can't make one that's so narrow and steep sided that you can swing it around, right? <clears throat> Sorry, there's two questions. Uh, what is IF stand for? Uh, we'll get there. Intermediate frequency. We'll get there. Uh, is there a reason we're not doing an FM radio? You might have covered this. Already. Because the demodulation is a pain in the ass and you won't have time. Otherwise, it would be a lot more fun. Yeah. Uh, the demodulation of AM is literally just a diode, which is why it's marked as a diode. Um, it's a diode. It's, a, it's the most simple low pass filter you can build. Um, but no, FM is a little bit trickier. You have to build a phase lock loop. And on top of building everything else, you just don't time. <clears throat> so we designed these guys in 421, 421, just filters and amplifiers. We covered filters and amplifiers 
maybe not in these particular exact configurations and purposes, but we covered filters and amplifiers last term. So we're not gonna do much of them this term. We will cover filters a little bit more. These guys are what we're gonna do the most. This is your first project, that's your second project, and then putting it all together is the end. You won't need this stuff. So really your project is here. <clears throat> and I'm giving you, actually cover that, <clears throat> your demodulator. Uh, demodulator designs vary from complex to far too complex to really, really stupid simple like AM. And we're gonna stay with AM again, again because of our time constraint. Um, so the way this works, your signal is incident on an antenna. Incident just means your signal hit the antenna, right? We picked it up. We're gonna filter some noise out of that signal, just real basic stuff. If, I'm, if I have an AM radio and my signal is from 540 kilohertz to 1700 megahertz, if I set off uh, a low pass filter and it cuts off at two megahertz, great. That just means everything past that is more or less filtered out. And that's why, what I might have as an RF filter. Maybe it adjusts a little bit. <clears throat> That RF filter can adjust with the frequency of the local oscillator. So let's say if my local oscillator is is tuned into a signal at let's say 540 kilohertz, maybe I can cut off one kilohertz, right? And then when I want to tune to one kilohertz, it's pushed up to 1500, and and I can it can move a little bit. I don't need to pick up every station if I'm only trying to listen to one. I'm gonna just generate a sinusoidal wave at a specific frequency. We'll talk about what frequency that is and why it is that frequency. We want it as clean and frequency stable as we can. That is the hardest part about the second lab. The, the design of the project is not hard. Getting it clean is the harder part. Um, this is the harder part of the class, is building the local oscillator. It's, it's both simple and frustrating. I apologize in advance. What it makes hard? Why is it hard? Remember how hard it was to get your sine wave to be clean? Oh, okay. Now you're making a sine wave instead of just amplifying one. Are you essentially going to be using an existing sine wave and oscillation? You're going to make your own sine wave oscillator. Wait, no, but are you teaching it which oscillation you need by essentially using some sort of resonance or something? Uh, resonance is pretty close to what you're doing, yeah. So, and that allows you to get uh, generate There's, ever oscillation. When, when we get to that, when we get to that project, oh, and yeah, God. when we get to that point, yeah, we'll get there. So the first amplifier is, hey, we just received this thing. We filtered out the big chunks that we don't want. Um, and we now we want to amplify it without adding a whole lot of noise. Typically use an LNA for that, low noise amplifier. If you take microwave 3, 532 next term, you'll build an LNA, which is awesome. Because then you can stick that LNA on the circuit and stick an antenna on it. And it's an even better AM radio to show in your interviews. Um, <clears throat> but um, for an AM radio, you kind of don't need one. For FM, maybe you need one. If you're receiving some other fancy thing, you absolutely probably need one. Um, it, it really depends on how strong and how high the frequency is. Um, AM radio is considered laughably low low frequency. It's in the hundreds of kilohertz, right? So you can kind of get away with murder. Mixer is the topic of the next lecture. I won't get into it. All it does, this is my RF signal. It's been amplified, but I have an RF signal coming in. I have a local oscillator signal coming in. I'm gonna have an intermediate frequency coming out. It's gonna multiply two waves together. We'll cover that in a different lecture. It's in depth, it's most of the topic of the class that makes it confusing. This is our super sexy, narrow, high performance filter which only passes the IF frequency. More on that later, but this is going to be set at one particular frequency. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna tune our local oscillator and it's gonna be able to be able to tune what frequency it sweeps between, right? It's gonna sweep between about one and two megahertz, give or take. And that's going to make multiply with this frequency and it's always gonna come out to be the same frequency depending on what channel we're trying to listen to. That's what a mixer does. Again, that's kind of like the, the without getting into the next lecture, that's what we're that's what we're building. After it comes out of this filter. There's a lot of insertion loss with it. I think it's like a negative six dB insertion loss. So we've lost three quarters of its power. So we probably have to amplify it again a little bit. Just use an op amp, use whatever you want. <clears throat> and we're gonna demodulate it. So here is a, a plot. So this is AM and I have my signal out of it. This is FM with the same signal modulation. You notice that the AM, this shouldn't be news to anybody. The AM, you can sort of see the sine wave on top of this, but in the FM, the frequency is changing, right? So when it's really low, the frequency is lower. And when this point is really high, 
the frequency is higher. And that's what we mean modulation. We're changing something about the carrier signal. Who knows, who, who knows or cares for the moment what frequency these are? are. They look about the same frequency. But we're changing something about them. We're modulating. And the thing that we're modulating, in this case, happens to be this signal. It will just be a tone in this case. But on the radio, it's speech. <clears throat> Uh, and then this is for driving you guys nuts, is this audio amplifier. Mm -hmm. Oh, we already talked about that question. OK, cool. Uh, no, we're not. We're going to stop. We're going to cover that, because this slide's cool. And I'm not wearing our t-shirt. Yes. OK. Uh, 15 minutes left. Who's got questions about this? You will reference this slide a bunch. Uh, one thing I'll say. I'm going to come out of, um, of, of my mode here. When you look at my slides, you'll notice how many animations I've got. Um, if you just look at them, um, it, it can be kind of a mess. This one, maybe not a, not a terrible example, uh, because it's, it's not. But some of mine will be very stacked on top of each other, because my animations start stacking over and over and over and over and over. Um, if you click this little button down here, this is presentation mode, or slideshow mode, then you can. You don't have to have one of these fancy pointers. Then you can just use the arrow keys, and you can go forward and back. So if you're looking at my slides, and there's too much crap in the way, forward and back. Space actually works to go forward. But, <clears throat> um, but I make these slides to present with. They're, they're great guides. Well, I mean, why rewrite it? I already wrote it for you. Um, but it, sometimes they can be kind of a mess. Uh, Questions, panic? What was, the, what was the first post of the modules? Uh, was it just the lecture slides? Or? Module, yeah, modules. I don't know, I'm just closing this. I'm going to get back into it. Uh, ben and Juan, how comfortable are you um, with spice? Wobbly, wobbly good? Okay. We will fix that. So modules is just the name for, I don't know why they call it modules, but it's just like where things are. Okay. Um, but you'll be able to see these three things, and then as I publish them, you'll see the other ones. There are more than eight lectures in this class, um, and some of these lectures are so big that we'll go through them slow enough that we'll, we'll sort of spread them out. Um, and then just like last term, we'll have a lot of lab days. So again, Ben and Juan, most of the time we'll be in here, but sometimes we will go into the lab. I'll tell you when they are in advance, so you can bring all your stuff to build, because there's not an official lab section for this class. But we'll just go into the lab instead of having a lecture. And then I'll hang out with you guys and help you troubleshoot. Cool? Cool. Uh, we will cover spice in depth. Maybe next time I'll bring my laptop after we do uh, lecture two. Um, and then after lecture three, we'll have our first lab day. So next Wednesday, probably our first lab day. So have all your equipment, have your measurement cables if you don't have them, have your perf boards. Um, do you, know, you missed the first part of the lecture. Do you, mean, do you know what I mean by perf board? Uh, no. There, yeah, so perf, perforated board. Um, it's green. Pull this back up again.